there guys all right today we are back with another kings and generals video this time the battle of kosovo 1389 the serbian ottoman wars documentary go ahead nothing here to say at the beginning let's just go ahead and dive right in the ottoman empire was the most powerful of its era and conquered many regions in a decisive fashion however their invasion of the balkans was met with stiff resistance the peoples of this region fought the intruders for almost 200 years and defied their rule long after that. Yeah, the Balkans the be a bit stubborn. The Battle of Kosovo in 1389 exemplifies this struggle for independence. So, let's see how this battle came to be. The Seljuk invasion, followed by the Crusades, completely changed the balance of power in the Middle East. The biggest victim of these events was the Byzantine Empire. It had started to lose lands to the Seljuks in the 11th century. Then the Crusades, despite helping the empire in the very beginning, led to the sack of its capital, Constantinople, by the Latins. Anatolia was fractured beyond anything seen before. The ethnic and religious makeup of Asia Minor changed as more Turkic tribes moved in. As if it wasn't enough, the Mongol invasion of the Middle East started in the 13th century. In 1241, they made their first foray into Anatolia, and in 1243 decisively defeated armies of the Seljuk Sultanate of Rum near modern-day Sivas. The Sultanate became a vassal of the Mongols, and a Byzantine successor state, the Empire of Nicaea, used that respite effectively. By 1261, the Greeks took back Constantinople and restored the Byzantine Empire in the northwestern part of Anatolia and central Balkans. Epic. Unfortunately right, for love them, to see the Mongols pushed more Turkic tribes out of Central Asia and the Iranian Plateau towards Anatolia. By 1299, oh, the leader of one of first. these tribes, okay. Osman, was granted a small piece of land along the Byzantine border for his military service to the Seljuks. In 1302, he defeated a Byzantine army near Nicaea. Then, Osman used the dissolution of the Sultanate in 1308 to gain independence. Unlike other Beylik leaders, he didn't care for the usual tribal infighting. Hmm. Osman and his descendants practiced a version of Islam that was stricter than that of the Seljuks and saw glory only in fighting against non-Muslims. His son Orhan took the Byzantine city of Prusa, the modern-day Bursa, and moved his capital there. Nicaea and Nicomedia fell to his troops in 1331 and 1337, and a few successful raids into Byzantine lands in Europe were conducted. Osmans, or Ottomans as they were called by the Christians, took their first city in Europe in 1354, using the fact that the walls of Gallipoli were destroyed by an earthquake. In the next decade, Adrianople, Plovdiv and Combatini were all conquered, and the new leader, Murad I, moved the Ottoman capital to Adrianople, modern-day Adena. It seemed that nothing could stop the Ottomans, but to the west of their new holdings, Serbians the mighty Serbian Empire was ready to defend itself. In 1371, King Vukasin attempted to use the fact that most of the Ottoman forces were in Asia to take Adrianople and drive them out of Europe. With around 35,000 troops under his command, he Ooh, moved to the valley of okay. the Maritza River. As no significant enemy force was in the area, the Serbian king did not send any scouts ahead, and his camp was virtually unguarded. But a small Ottoman Ooh, army Pasha. of a thousand or so riders attacked the camp during the night. Thousands of Serbs were killed in their sleep, and even more drowned in the Maritza during the chaos. Oh, fire, the king, brutal. his brothers, and many aristocrats died in this battle, which destroyed the Serbian Empire. Almost all Serbian and Bulgarian aristocrats became the vassals of Murad, among them the Prince of Moravian Serbia, Lazar. Despite that, when most of the Ottoman army moved to central Anatolia, Lazar rebelled alongside many other local feudal lords. His troops defeated a small army at the Battle of Plokhnik in 1386 and pushed the Ottomans out of southern Serbia. This victory increased Lazar's authority tenfold, and he managed to form a broad alliance consisting of Serbs, Bulgars, Bosnians and Albans. 
even some bohemian and Hungarian aristocrats joined his army. Okay. But this time around, he would be facing the best the Ottomans could offer. They're Sultan Murad, alongside his sons Bayezid and Jakob, moved towards Pristina in the June of 1389. Lazar and his troops would be waiting for them on the Kosovo, the fields of the blackbirds in Serbian. Let's take this opportunity to talk about the composition of the opposing forces. Oh, yes, please, give me the Murad me the had continued in the footsteps of his father and grandfather, expanding his regular army, which meant that Ottoman troops were very different from those once fielded by the Seljuks. Still, the Sultan did have a significant number of light cavalry, called Akinji. They were armed with composite bows, axes and maces, and usually acted as raiders or a flanking force. The regular cavalry, called Sepahi, were a somewhat heavier horsemen with lances and bows. The irregular infantry was represented by Azabs, who carried bows, polearms or halberds. Ottoman sultans also started a practice of using personal slaves from Christian peoples to form their elite Janissary troops. Yep. They also were armed Janissaries with various are weapons. Now. Janissaries served as the Sultan's guard and had both cavalry and infantry units. The Ottomans also had early cannons in their service. Altogether, very, Murad very had 50,000 troops there. in this battle. It's interesting just how, like, the Janissaries became, were the personal guard of the Sultan, but yet they were, like, they were Christians, right? Well, originally, they, some probably obviously would convert, but, like, originally, you know, they came from Christian conquered, like, territories that the Muslims conquered that were formerly Christian. I don't know why my brain's fucking poofing right now. Um, but it's just interesting. The Sultan would trust, you know, I feel like you'd rather put your trust, you know, obviously in your own people and not on foreigners that you're enslaving. That's the one thing that's always kind of confused me about the Janissaries. On the other hand, the Serbs had a truly European army. Most of their cavalry was heavy, with only a handful of light hussars in oh, support. It's dark. Serb infantry used see both bows troops. and melee weapons according to the situation. Lazar had brought 30,000 warriors with him. Mountains surround the field of Kosovo to the west and east. Lazar knew that he would not be able to contain the Ottomans in the open plains to the north and hoped that the terrain would prevent his enemies from using their superior numbers. The prince commanded the centre with 15,000 troops, with cavalry in the first line and infantry in the second. The left was led by Vlatko Vukovic, while the right was under the command of a local aristocrat, Vuk Brankovic. Both had around 7,000 warriors. On the opposite side, the Sultan stayed in the center with 20,000 of his regular troops, while Jakob commanded 15,000 Anatolian warriors on the left, and Bayezid was on the right with the same numbers again. The Ottoman front line consisted of archers, who had dug a small protective trench and reinforced it with stakes. Ooh. Most of the artillery was in the center for both armies. The battle began on the morning of June 15th with a volley from the Serb cannons, which failed to reach Ottoman lines due to the distance. Ottoman cannons also weren't effective, and their archers were ordered forward. What was the <laughs> Lazar They just fucking just shot the cannons just for show. They're like, yeah, we got cannons, let's just shoot them. Our responded We're not by ordering his all. cavalry forward, but this attack was stopped by the Ottoman center and right flank. What was the point of the stakes? They looked like they did nothing to stop the cavalry. Serb cavalry suffered many casualties, but on the right, the attack was successful. The Serbs pushed the enemy all the way back to their camp. However, Bayezid on the Ottoman right was also pushing back the Serbian left after some initial difficulty. Huh. Still, Lazar had the initiative and Murad was close to panic. This moment of the battle is still hotly debated in the Balkans. Leader of the right flank of the Christian army, Vuk Brankovic, left the field with most of the troops under his what? command. Why? Some say that he was a traitor and had an arrangement with the Ottomans to abandon the battle. Others claim that he saved the troops that allowed him to resist the Ottoman onslaught for two more decades. Naturally, mm. that freed up the Ottoman left, which pushed forward and attacked the Serb center from the flank. 
the Serbian left slowly retreated under overwhelming enemy pressure. I think I might believe the whole, uh, he sided with the Ottomans here. Um, because that just doesn't, he has such a huge advantage on that, on that flank, it didn't make sense. To and soon their whole army was surrounded. We don't have all the details, but two events happened simultaneously at this point in the battle. First, Murad sent the majority of his troops forward to finish off the enemy, leaving himself nearly undefended. Then, a group of Serb knights used that weakness to break the line of his bodyguards and assassinate the Sultan. Holy shit! Christian sources assert that 11 knights sacrificed themselves to allow their comrade, Milos Obelik, to strike the enemy leader, who was killed on the spot. On another side of the battlefield, Lazar died fighting. Both Lazar and Milos are venerated as saints by the Serbian church. After the death of the prince, the fight was over and turned into a bloodbath. Yep. Ultimately, the casualties on both sides were catastrophic. But still, the Ottoman invasion of Europe continued, and many battles that we are planning to cover in the future were fought. While creating this documentary, we used the series of lectures... Alright, that's the end of the video then. Um, by the way, I would totally recommend great courses, you know. Because the sexual, you know, professors teaching them. That's actually a really, a really cool thing. Anyways, that was the Battle of Kosovo, 1389 Serbian Ottoman Wars documentary by Kings and Generals. I hope you guys enjoyed. I certainly did. Um, yeah, these earlier videos by Kings and Generals, of course, are really short. And uh, they do cover information very fast. Nothing wrong with it. It's obviously, you know, these are the early days, right, um, of Kings and Generals. And they certainly have gotten so much better over time. But these still are not bad. Uh, these were the kind of videos that got me into their channel, you know, years ago when I first started watching them. I still can't even, I don't remember what video I first watched of theirs, but I think it was around this time. Because it was when they had the, when, it was definitely around when this um, guy was doing their commentary for them. Because as, as the last Kings and Generals video that we watched, I don't remember that dude's voice at all. I only know uh, this guy's voice. But, um, yeah. Anyways, I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.